Floyd and Irene. Uh, we're going to get started with our presentation of rehab here in just a moment. Nick Algie is going to come down and take care of the first part of it. How many in here knows what rehab is? All right. We've got some educated folks. That's what I like about the crowds that come to the Roosevelt. We get a good bunch of educated people here. Um, rehab is an acronym for five initiatives that we are working on this year. Uh, R is for the Roosevelt. We're standing here in the Roosevelt right now. Um, e is for the Earthship Florida Project. How many of you people have been down to the Earthship? All right, I knew I saw some familiar faces. All right, I'll stay away from the front of the speaker. Uh, H is for Haiti. It's, we have a Haiti initiative, and uh, we'll be talking to you all a little bit more about that. We have a few people in the room, actually, that are, are going to be a valuable part of that team as well. A is for affordable, zero energy buildings, and uh, we have a few of the people who are participating in that project tonight as well. We have a project going on, a co-housing project going on in uh, Carrollwood that we're getting ready to start up. We'll tell you a little bit more about co-housing here very shortly, but um, how many of you all have heard of the term co-housing before? All right. So we are, um, and then also the B is for beginning financial permaculture, and that's what ties it all together. One of our main goals that we're trying to achieve with what we have going on right now is that we want to see our culture move in a more sustainable direction. So one of the things that needs to happen for that to become a reality is that we begin to think more locally. Now that doesn't mean that uh, we give up on the global economy, it just means that we begin to think more sustainably and that means to, that we will be trading with one another uh, in a much more thoughtful manner. And with all of that being said, Nick, are you ready to tell everyone about the Roosevelt? Hey, hey, hey. All right, everyone, this is Nick Algy. Welcome, everybody. So uh, the Roosevelt Building, that's where we are right now. This is our headquarters for all the different projects that we have going on. It's actually called the Roosevelt Building. It's a historic building over 100 years old, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt used to feed the Rough Riders here back in the turn of the century when he was um, housed here during the uh, Spanish-American uh, War. So, um, so this is a community flex space. We want this to be a blank canvas for the community to participate in the arts, education, and business. We got into the building a couple years ago with a creative partnership with the building owner. It was a condemned building by the city of Tampa. The previous tenants that were in here stripped the whole building bare, including chipping the tiles off the floor, cutting the plumbing out, pulling the electrical out. Uh, so here's the Roosevelt picture from uh, 1925. As you can see here, this is one of the first versions of the mural on the wall that represents Teddy Roosevelt. It has evolved quite a bit over time. So the first thing that we did to this building was refinish the floor. As I said, the tiles got chipped off, so um, that was really starting in ground zero. We partnered with several different companies to help bring this building to life. Tarmac um, actually has a, a green concrete. They use recycled fly ash, so their concrete is less energy intensive. And this was really the first upgrade that we did to the building. Um, there you see green crete is the product that Tarmac uh, presents. Now, after the concrete floor was laid, we did an acid stain to the floor. Helps to stick with the era of when the building was constructed and um, the, the acid stain that we used was a company called Simstain. It's actually a very um, benign, um, you, my general contractor actually has told me that you can drink it and it won't really do much to you. We haven't tried that yet. Uh, and as you can see here, after the floor was finished, we just simply laid the um, Simstain on the floor and then applied a clear coat to it. Um, and we're really happy with the way that it's come out. Again, it has kind of that authentic look from um, the era when this building was built. Our next technology partner, Synovia Systems, all the lighting in this building 
is LED lighting. Synovia actually carries a, a suite of products that are uh, solar panel, uh, LED related. As you can see here, these are um, some of the LEDs um, that uh, are in the building. Brian, can you talk about some of the wattage that makes the LEDs different? Um, all of these lights that are in here are 10 watts or less. Most of the can, car can lights are a 6 watt product. The main canopy lights overhead are 10 watts. All of the lights that are right, lighting up this room right now are less, use less energy than a 100 watt can. <laughs> so, after the, uh, the lighting was in, uh, we moved to put the bathrooms in. We had a host of companies that helped us to support the product. We had a team of volunteers that came in. And uh, the initial events that we threw here, the first half dozen events, we're actually off-grid, and this is a demonstration of the veggie power generator that we had that powered the first half dozen events we had. So I don't know how well y'all can hear that, but that really demonstrates a lot of what we are about here and, and, and everything that we're doing. That's our in-house Green MacGyver, basically finds parts and makes things happen. The next big project we did was tackling the roof. Uh, when we came into this building, when it would rain, it would actually rain down on the floor. The first thing we did was put in these uh, skylights you can see. Now, instead of typical skylights that actually let the uh, lighting through, these skylights are actually a, a, a prism that pushes light through. And, and the day, for those of you that have been in here, you know that it's just a really beautiful daylit space. Um, so right now, these are uh, pilings that are going up onto the roof. When we laid the new roof, we put pilings down that will basically support the decking structure, which we will put up there. And in a minute, I'll talk about the rooftop garden that we're going to put on. So we partnered with several pro uh, companies to do the roof. Um, WDG Silicones and Thunder Bay Roofing were really crucial to helping us put this spray foam on the roof. Now, this is a, a waste product from agricultural uh, soy. They take the, the husks, the shellings, and um, there's a combination of several different things in this. There's two applications on top of the soy-based material that we put on. Uh, the first one is a recycled, um, industrial roofs are typically like a rubber roof, it's like an EDM. So what this company does is actually cryogenically freezes it and then pulverizes it. So this is the first layer of silicone that's going on top of the spray. And then we actually applied a second one which was white. Um, so two layers of, of silicone went on to protect the foam from the UV rays. If UV hits that, it will actually deteriorate. So we just need to make sure we perform maintenance on the building, um, on the roof, to make sure that it, it retains its structural integrity. There's several things that this roof application does and, and why we chose this product. First of all, it's very green because they use different recycling within the product. Um, second, it adds structural integrity to the roof and it actually helps to um, uh, prevent uh, hurricane gusts that come through. Um, and uh, on top of that, it's um, the, the white silicone is actually a food grade silicone, so we can use that water and harvest that water 
for the um, agriculture that we'll do here on the building. This is actually a really good story too of the like kind exchange and the partnerships that, that we work with on all of our projects. Um, Brian, you want to talk a little bit about the, the synergy between all the companies? Um, when, we first, when I first started living at this roof, one of the problems that we had with this building was that when it rained outside, it rained inside. Now you can imagine a building that's been that's sat empty for a number of years with rain coming in. Every time it rained, we had lots of birds in here, so on and so forth. So we wanted a roofing product that would solve more than one problem. Whenever we, whenever we vet new products, we look for things that have multiple functions. Uh, this particular, as Nick said, this particular product provides structural integrity, hurricane resistance. It provides a great R50 uh, equivalent value of insulation on the top of the building here. It also provides reflectivity and a rainwater catchment surface. We started researching different companies that provided uh, this structural foam roofing, and we found a company in Ohio, uh, West Development Group, WDG Silicones, and they were they had a great product from what we understood. It was one of the greenest on the market, so we contacted them. They did tell us that they didn't have a Florida product code approval, and that in order to be able to sell their product here in Florida, they needed that product code approval. Well, we had a great relationship with the building department here. We uh, actually, Rudy and I, spent a few hours talking with the senior plans examiners and the senior building official at the time about what we were planning to do here at the building. We got a limited local approval to apply this, and then through a partnership with Russell Ferlita Engineering here locally, uh, Russell is an antique car enthusiast, and he had just purchased a brand new two-car trailer to haul his antique cars around to the different shows here, and he asked us, he said, so do you think that uh, that foam would ins insulate the inside of my trailer? Well, absolutely it will. So he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll provide the engineering data you guys need for the state if, uh, if you guys will insulate the inside of my trailer. So I called Chris at West Development Group, said, hey, Chris, is there going to be enough material to insulate the inside of a trailer? Yeah, sure, there will be. I said, well, great, we have an engineer that will help you guys get your Florida product code approval. So we, um, <clears throat> we got the engineer involved. Uh, we insulated his car trailer. We insulated the roof, we sprayed it on, we put all the products on there. Uh, Thunder Bay Roofing, Eric Williams of Thunder Bay Roofing was very, very instrumental in getting this product down. And as a result of uh, all of these, these marriages here in business, the uh, West Development Group now has a product that they can sell in Florida. And Thunder Bay Roofing has a product that they can offer out there that's one of the greenest on the market. And we have a fantastic roof that immediately changed the inside temperature of this building. We uh, actually, the day we installed this, it was 11 degrees, or it was four degrees cooler out, outside than it was the second day. It was 11 degrees cooler inside the building the following day after having put this on, even though it was four degrees warmer outside. So we noticed an immediate drop in temperature inside the building. Turn it back over to Nick. So that's a great story, and it's another representation of what the Roosevelt is. Uh, it really is the philosophy and action of everything that we're doing. A culmination of collaboration between different entities, different individuals, and different businesses. Um, the next uh, upgrade we did, anybody from Water Source Technologies in the house? We had a couple folks that were going to come down. Um, our air conditioning unit uh, that you can actually see right here. Um, it is a prototype unit. It's uh, incredibly efficient. We actually capture the condensation, which within this system is turned into fresh drinking water, um, over 100 gallons of fresh drinking water a day, and we're actually working to flush our toilets with the water from the air conditioning system. We've had great coverage in the media. Uh, this is an installation that is part of phase four of the construction process. Right now we're in phase two. We just got the CO for the building. It took two years of blood, sweat, and tears. And um, how many folks were actually here for the December 1st open house? All right, pretty good, pretty good crowd. Um, that was our kind of official. We got the CO and uh, invited the community out to celebrate. Um, Billy Dunn, raise your hand. Billy Dunn over here is an excellent, excellent craftsman. Uh, he works with wood. He works with reharvest wood. When uh, utility companies have to take trees out that are in the urban setting, they call him up, and um, 
what Billy does is actually reharvest this wood. He does beautiful furniture, skateboards, you name it, he can do it. And this is actually a culmination of several different pieces of wood that he has saved from different projects over the years. Little did he know that he, he saved it for our project and we're grateful to have him on board. Uh, this is a concrete countertop that actually has fiber optics in it so that it glows at night. Um, again, uh, this is acid staining just like we did with the floor. Um, this is uh, a picture of the continuation of our mural on the wall here. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, the hands representing collaboration, and of course the balance of nature and technology, um, which is across the top. This is a picture of an event that we just had last week. Had a, a great support from the artistic community. Uh, one of the first businesses that we'll be launching here in the building is um, a tea business. We've actually got tea coming straight from China. And then uh, we'll actually be growing teas here in the building. This is a vertical garden that will be part of our aquaponics integrated system that will be going in on the wall behind us over there. Um, the wall behind you on the right, in front of me on the left. And um, this is part of a, a larger system. Um, we're going to have vertical hydroponics on the rooftop garden. And this integrated system will have a series of steps cut starting in the back of the property, going to the roof, going to the vertical garden, and then um, ultimately cycling back. It's a closed loop system. So the higher order plants, the ones that need more nutritional value, your tomatoes, your strawberries, things of that nature, they'll be on the, the rooftop. Um, the uh, lower order plants, the ones that need less nutrition, um, your, your herbs, your teas, your flowers, and then we'll actually be harvesting those teas to serve at the, the bar. Um, and then again, this is a closed loop system, so the water comes through, and then we'll have uh, what's known as a float tank. Um, duckweed and, and other uh, materials will feed the fish. So ultimately, the fish feed the plants, and the plants feed the fish. This is a rendering of the rooftop uh, system that will go in. And um, we actually um, were working to do zero energy conversion. Again, we have done zero energy events here when we work off of the generator. Uh, this is actually a picture of a company in Vermont that's going to be, is it Vermont? Canada? You want to talk about that real quick? Brian's our technology guru here. The, the wind turbine that you see right here is Masterflow Technologies. They're a uh, company out of Canada. And this is a micro turbine that is supposed to start generating wind somewhere between three and five, three and four miles an hour. Typical generators don't actually start effectively producing energy till around nine miles an hour, which here in Florida, we have a tendency to have either very, very little wind or a whole lot of wind. So this, this turbine is going to be a beta test site for Florida here. We're going to see how well it works. It's going to be a part of our integrated uh, alternative energy system here. We'll also be doing some solar thermal. We'll be using some parabolic trough reflectors that are focused on a, an evacuated tube system that will pr produce uh, high-quality steam and will actually run a steam turbine through an organic Rankin cycle, and that will generate uh, the supplement of our electrical energy here. We'll also have some solar panels that will be running the various pumps that pump the uh, aquaponics system as well. And by the way, the, uh, the young lady in the picture with the strawberries back there, that's Michelle Silva's daughter, Vivian. And uh, Vivian's been out to our Earthship project many times. We actually hosted a, um, a workshop at Michelle's house as we were building an aquaponics system in her backyard. And she's got that thing up and running. I know that her and Chris have put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in that. See some pictures of it. It looks great. So we're pretty ambitious today. Five presentations. A lot of our slides are 15 to 20 seconds. Um, we're coming to the close of the Roosevelt section. Uh, we have several upcoming workshops coming up. Here's a mind map. I don't know how well you can see that, but um, our calendar is about to be flushed with different folks in the community that are going to come out and give presentations and education of value on their scope of work, their interest, and their industry. Um, we also have several different businesses that we'll be incubating and launching. We're going to talk a little bit about that as well in the fifth presentation. Um, but uh, just to start briefly, uh, moving towards a restaurant and retail license, opening the bar full time, having a coffee, kava, and tea space, um, having a um, um, 
Wi-Fi, internet cafe, business center needs. We've got a couple printers that are on the way. So we've got a lot of uh, exciting things coming up and uh, we couldn't have done it on our own. There's three of us up here talking about the projects that we're working on, but this has been a collection of, it's, it's hundreds now of uh, individuals and companies that have come in to participate and are continuing in an ongoing participation. So these are several logos of some of the companies that are involved, and then uh, just a few clips of some pictures of folks that um, have been around and, and just putting in hour after hour after hour. So, you know, we really want this to be a blank space for participation. How many people here put your hands up, um, either sent out an email about this event, made a phone call, made a post on a social media site? It's about half, that's, that's, that's great, and that's exactly what we want. You know, we want this to be uh, a collaboration to its fullest extent. So we'll also be, throughout the course of, this is phase two again of the renovation, um, we are open as a rental shell. Uh, we can do all kinds of different events here. We can do wedding receptions, we can do live music events, we uh, have several educational workshops coming up, uh, retail space. So please join us in this um, and come and participate. We're gonna move on to the second presentation, which is titled Earthship Florida. And Brian is going to come up and um, tell you a little bit about that project, which is another really groundbreaking project here in the Florida, Tampa Bay area. Thank you, Nick. I don't know if, uh, if you guys have had a chance to check out the aquaponics setup over here. We've got a little mini aquaponics setup going, and um, we, it's, it's a little bit of a demonstration unit to kind of let you know what's to come. Uh, actually, in the back of the building is where we're going to have some very large fish tanks that effluent will be pumped up to a rooftop garden. Um, one of the things that we're going to have going on here very soon is we're going to we're trying to find a used shark cage. We have to get a lift system that goes up to the third floor. And um, I think there's nothing better to get you to the third floor than a used shark cage. So, if any of you guys know where one is, I got Dr. Ryan Moyer back here. He's on, he's on it. And, uh, we're uh, we're going to make that happen here pretty soon. But uh, the rooftop patio is something that's very exciting for me. We're going to have some hydroponics up on the roof. We're going to have a space up there to hang out and among the plants. And uh, it'll be a, be a fantastic space here in Ebor. All right, so Earthship Florida. It's a project that we started a couple of years ago. Actually, a couple of my brothers in that project are, are here tonight. We got Danny and Nicholas back here that I see. These guys are putting a lot of work on the short run tonight. Um, the Earthship is a project in Manatee County. Looks like we're having some difficulties going on. So at any rate, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Earthship while they figure out what's going on up there with the, uh, with the projector. But um, it's, a, it's a project located on 10 acres in Manatee County. It's about probably about an hour south of here. I know a lot of you have been out there already. Um, what we have going on out there is a home that is made out of tires filled with rammed earth, cans and bottles and uh, all kinds of things that you would normally throw away have gone into the construction of this home. Um, we actually had an engineer who took a look at the plans for us a few times, and he said that we would be looking at somewhere in the realm of, the, uh, realm of 500 mile an hour winds to pull the building apart. So, pretty 
pretty safe in a hurricane. Um, if we ever have any 500 mile an hour winds, it really won't matter anyway when your house blows down and gone. The, uh, the home, actually, it started out as a home and uh, through a series of events has uh, come into the ownership or the uh, collaborative ownership of this organization. And what we're intending to do out there is bring in, again, a number of sustainable businesses there. The, uh, the first of those businesses is organic meadery. And mead is the conversion of honey and uh, sometimes other fruits into an organic wine. And that's something that can be 100% locally sourced. And again, through one of our partnerships, Joey Redner of Cigar City Brewing, uh, he's going to be on the board of the meadery. And we will have instant distribution for our product when it's, when it's made. And um, we are, we're also looking to produce some of the ingredients on site. So uh, part of that 10 acres is going to be a food forest that will include, include a number of trees. Um, all right, we got some, we got some action going up here. Back up cables! Yeah! <laughs> all right, so there's the 10 acre site. You can see in red up here. If you take a look at the property around it, you see that there's been a lot of stuff cleared. This is actually in the middle of a large agricultural section. And um, this is a big natural wetlands back here. So this plant, this, this particular piece of property is, uh, it sort of acts as a buffer to that wetland. We've done a number of things. Uh, according to permaculture design there, we've done some swaling and uh, that swaling is to help slow down the flow of water. Sometimes we get a lot of sheet flow across here because of all the vegetation that's been removed in the area. So that swaling helps to divert the water, hold it in place on the property and makes it so that it's available to the plants. Um, the, the first part of, of this project involved the permitting. Now, the state of Florida is actually one of the two hardest places in the country to get a building permit for alternative, um, for alternative types of building. So a house made out of tires filled with dirt, cans, and bottles. As you, as you might imagine, I got a few funny looks when I walked into the building department. <laughs> However, after um, our, my first set of plans that I got actually came from Michael Reynolds of Earthship Biotexture in, in Taos, New Mexico, which you guys uh, have probably heard of him. And um, we basically had to convert those into something that they could understand. So as you can see here, this is Fred. He's the inspector that got assigned to our project. Um, so that basically we wouldn't have to keep educating the building officials as they came out. We had one building inspector. Once we had the permit in hand, it was time to get to work. And as you can see, Danny and I here are hard at work. Um, we, uh, we laid down the foundation. Uh, we basically had to clear the site. Actually, when we first got to this property, he couldn't walk from the road to the back. And we had a lot, a lot of uh, land work that had to be done in the beginning. We spent a lot of time pulling equipment out of the mud. And finally, we got to work putting the foundation out. Now, one of the things that the building inspector said to us first was, I don't know what I'm looking at, but this looks like what's on the plan, so I'm going to sign off on it. <laughs> now, here we have, as you see, the red tubing. This is before the concrete went down. This is a lot of PEX tubing that's laid in the concrete. That's part of our alternative cooling system. And what that does, actually, is we will be circulating cool well water through the slab, and that'll help remove heat from the building in the summertime. Now that's used in conjunction with the dense thermal mass of the house, and that helps to maintain a stable temperature inside. Uh, we've had the press out a number of times. This is actually Danny and I here again, uh, pounding the first couple of tires. One of the things that we came to realize very quickly was that filling uh, 1,600 tires full of dirt with a sledgehammer was going to take a long time, so we got volunteers. We, uh, we held workshops while we were out there, and we taught people about what we were doing. Um, this is also another method of, of our uh, cooling system here. These tubes, as you see, they go about uh, 50 to 60 feet away from the building. They're buried um, pretty close to probably anywhere from 18 to 21 feet underneath the berm there. Um, they, we tried to get them about 12 feet below the average grade, which at that depth here in Florida, we maintain a fairly constant temperature. So air gets gently pulled through those tubes and it's cool when it makes it inside the house. Uh, as you can see, we finally got the tires up. Uh, there's 1,600 of them there, each one of them filled with about six wheelbarrow loads of dirt. They weigh a little bit over 300 pounds apiece. They're pretty heavy, took a lot of dirt. Uh, that makes for a dense thermal mass, though. That's part of what makes this building work. 
Now in the middle here, what you see is a constructed wetlands. This is for the gray water system in the home. So all of the gray water, everything that comes out of uh, any fixture in the home other than the kitchen sink and the toilet goes through that filtration system. Eventually it'll be planted full of food producing plants and we'll, uh, we'll provide uh, re-harvesting re of that water. It'll then be used for toilet flushing. Um, after it goes through the toilets or the kitchen sink, it goes into a biodigester outside where uh, methane gas can be captured off of it and used for heating and cooking. Um, then we, it goes through another constructed wetlands on the outside, and that is filled with uh, tuberous plants that are used for, can be later harvested and used for ethanol production. All of the rainwater that falls on top of this building fall, goes, is diverted into a series of cisterns. As you can see, they're plumbed together here. This is actually a line that is buried. Under the ground goes around to the house and to uh, two other cisterns on the other side. So there's a total of 4,400 gallons of, of water cisterns buried here. This water is organized according to its end use. So in other words, we don't filter the water that we wash clothes as much as we filter our drinking and cooking water. So it's purified for drinking and cooking. It's cleaned for showers and for, um, for bathing and, and uh, washing clothes and so on and so forth. Um, after we got uh, the walls up, it was time to start putting up the inside support system for the roof. Uh, here we used a technique of, of stacking blocks that actually uses no mortar in between it. It's an exterior mortar. It has a lot of fibers in it and that holds it up. Got the columns up and then it was time to put something on top of the columns. Now, as we were uh, looking for our lentil system here, I decided that I wanted to use a little bit different material. In order to do that, what we used was paper creed. In order to do that, we needed a machine that would chop up a whole lot of uh, newspaper. So we took, um, took an old finish mower apart, took the parts away out of it, went to the co-op locally and uh, actually tractor supply, found an old uh, uh, cattle trough there that was, had a big hole in the middle of it and they couldn't sell it. So we, we, it was exactly where we needed the hole and so we converted it into a paper creed machine. Uh, here you see Ben White, one of the guys at the, the place, uh, stirring up some of the paper creed right here. Uh, there was a lot of stirring that went on with that, but uh, it did a great job of taking a lot of uh, newspapers that was supplied to us by um, WSI of Sarasota. Now, occasionally, things when you're experimenting with new stuff, they break. Here's Danny right here, uh, fix, repairing one of our, uh, the first version of this. Uh, but finally we got everything working and we made some papercrete beams. So papercrete is, is basically chopped up newspaper mixed with cement. Now the fibers of that uh, paper, just like a paper towel absorbs water very well, the fibers of that paper absorb cement very well. So when it's put together, it, uh, it actually hardens, becomes very rigid, becomes structural. It also has about the same uh, insulation value as pink fiberglass insulation. As you can see, they're up in place here. They got lined with rebar and filled with regular concrete, and uh, they're now ready for the uh, support to be the support system of the roof. As you see, there are four domes on there. Uh, there I am doing a little bit of welding on the domes. I, I learned how to build domes as a result of the airship, as did Danny, Nicholas, and a lot of other people. Part of uh, part of what we do is we learn what we're doing out there, and then we teach others how to do that as well. Here's one of the completed dome cages, and it, uh, it's getting ready to be installed on the roof. Now, a big part of um, what we do at the airship, as I said, we learn how to do these things, and we invite others to come out with us. The, uh, the first permaculture design course in Tampa Bay that I'm aware of was held at the airship out there, and we have a number of the members of the Permaculture Guild. As a matter of fact, some of the folks you see in the picture there out here in the audience tonight. This was a couple of years ago in March. Uh, all these people came and lived out on the uh, Earthship property for about 12 days, and it was chilly. So uh, we had some solar showers going on back there, but uh, if you didn't get to the solar showers right at sunset, then you got a cool shower that night. Um, as you can see, we've had a number of different people out. Um, we've had some kids from the Montessori school out. Uh, they are grade school kids. We've had high school kids out that are... Um, from the, uh, that, I think, I believe that was from the Indoor Outdoor Academy, and uh, they're high school kids. We have a bunch of um, USF students, who are, uh, let's see, there's St. Pete College and USF students here who've come out on uh, internship programs and have uh, had a chance to learn about different aspects of it here. These guys are shooting some grade right here and learning about that. 
Um, and then this is, I believe, Lee Spann of Bay News 9 here who came out to do an interview and, uh, and also to spread the word about what we're doing with the Earthship. Um, the next part of the Earthship project is Enterprise. Now, what we are looking to do out here is create a number of sustainable businesses. Aquaponics being one of them. Again, we have a, uh, an aquaponics set up back here in, in the back. Um, so, the, again, the organic meadery, I mentioned it before. And um, we will be growing some of the, um, the ingredients for the meadery there on site. Um, we are also going to be doing some alternative energy production there. One of the things that we'll be using is a, is a gasifier. If any, are you, you familiar with a gasifier or heard of gasification? All right, I see some hands up back there. Gasification is the conversion of cellulosic material uh, through pyrolysis into a syngas. It is the control of oxygen and uh, temperature to create a chemical reaction that actually splits the molecules of organic material, so like cellulosic material apart. So you can put things in there like wood, horse manure, donuts, all kinds of things in there and, uh, and actually convert it into hydrogen, uh, methane, and CO2 and, and um, carbon monoxide. Now when you burn this, it's actually a very, very clean burning gas. It burns as clean as natural gas. Um, it actually sequesters far more carbon than is released during that pyrolysis, that, during that um, chemical reaction. So it's a very, very uh, green way to produce energy. Now one of the plans we have is to actually go into in, in areas that are sensitive wetlands and remove invasive tree species like melaleuca and Brazilian pepper and take those through gasification, convert them to electrical energy by running a uh, gas turbine. You can also run a uh, gasoline generator or you could run an automobile on it. During World War II, 90% of the automobile traffic in Switzerland was run on wood gas. All of the, they converted all their cars to wood gas because there was no gasoline, so it made an excellent motor fuel. We're going to use it here as a way to power the entire operation there and also to sell some clean energy back to the local grid there. Um, now, some of the other things that we'll be planning on doing um, involve that gasification. The byproduct of gasification is a biochar. So what's left over after that chemical reaction is an, sort of like an activated charcoal. And the Mayans and the Incans used to use that as a soil amendment. It holds moisture very well, and it also uh, releases a lot, of, a lot of nutrients into the soil. Um, so organic food production is one part of it. Uh, we've, we've been talking with Rick Martinez of Sweetwater Organics. I think some of you guys probably know him. He's interested in giving us a hand down there to, um, to get uh, a little bit of organic food production going on. We've been talking with members of the Permaculture Guild about getting a food forest going on down there. In addition to our aquaponics setup, also, a big part of it, again, is education. We want to have an educational center, a place where people can come and learn about this. We have a number of other buildings that will be going in on the site other than the airship itself, and each one of those will represent a very innovative and sustainable technology. So in, in addition to the educational center, will be a technology center, a technology park and a, a retreat place where people can come and, and stay on the site and learn about the things that are going on there, learn how to duplicate that in other areas. Um, we're going to have a few little uh, short movies here. These are some artist renderings. This is actually Robert Segundo, who's with Fire of Hope. He, um, he did these renderings for us, and Robert's done a fantastic job. As you can see, some of the buildings interspersed through here. This will be sort of the campus, if you will. There'll be some classrooms. There'll be some places where people can stay while they're on, on the site. Organic food forest here. The pond that was dug out, is that's actually where all the dirt came from, and we built the airship there. And um, like I said, the vision for this is a, is a place for people to come and learn about these types of technologies. We can hold events there. We'll have festivals to raise awareness. Uh, again, this is a uh, larger commercial aquaponics system, something uh, very similar to the vision we have for the airship there. And um, as you can see, it'll be a little bit different. It's one of the things that as we were doing this project, um, people were always saying, well, this is the, when people who came out for workshops would say to me, well, this is great, but I, this is 10 acres. I live in the city. Um, 
So what we decided to do was to do the same thing here at the Roosevelt. This is an urban environment. We're going to be doing aquaponics here at the building, combining rooftop gardening, combining vertical farming, combining uh, aquaponics and gardening in the back. So this is going to be a mini version of the, of the uh, Earthship here. Each one of these is an opportunity for people to connect and to learn about what we have going on. So this is just a fly through of, of kind of what a larger, a larger scale aquaponics setup would be looking like. Again, we have uh, Michelle Silva back here. She owns a business called Passion for Produce in Sarasota, and uh, she also has a nice, lovely aquaponics setup in her backyard. Um, this is a rendering of the inside of the Earthship with some plants in it. If you remember, if you'll recall that uh, area in the center there. Um, that is the, the setup for the uh, aqua or for the uh, gray water garden inside of the building. And as you can see, there's a large skylight that runs down the center of the building. Each one of these domes has a, an operable skylight on it, and that's actually part of the cooling system of the building. Uh, those domes will be painted black. The top of the domes will be painted black so that they will create a convective current. Now here you've got to see that this would be some of the mead operation. Um, we would also like to have the operation set up so that there would be a tasting room there and also a gathering space and a place to entertain inside of the building. And um, so basically, again, this just becomes a place for people, an interesting space for people to gather and to learn about what's going on there. We'll, we'll be talking about alternative ways to construct homes, alternative ways to create businesses that are local and that use local resources and that keep keep the money in the local economy, keep the local economy stimulated by local businesses. So as you can see, the outside of this building is earth burned all the way up to the roof. That adds to the structural integrity of it, but it also is a uh, very important aspect of what, what goes into making that building work. Um, Again, this is, these are the businesses that we are looking to bring in here. The Meadery, locally sourced ingredients, organic farm, permaculture food forest, the Mayaka Mushroom Company. Uh, Nicholas and Danny back here have inoculated quite a few oak logs with uh, shiitake and oyster mushrooms. Is that right? All right. What's that? All right, some turkey tail mushrooms. I've never even heard of that one. <laughs> Um, and then the soil building techniques, as we mentioned, part of our alternative energy system will be, uh, we'll go into some soil building as well as the permaculture design. Permaculture is designed to be an intensive agricultural system that increases soil fertility and eliminates waste in, in, in a cycle. Uh, the educational center will continue to hold workshops as we complete the build out of the building and the property. Uh, then, then again, this will become a retreat and event space and a place for, to, for people to come and learn. The, in the Sustainable Technology Park we will be doing prototype development. That's one of the things that we did while we were out there was in the course of building the airship, one of the things we determined that it was going to be very labor intensive to keep pounding dirt and tires. So we came up with a method of compressing earth and getting being able to take advantage of that dense thermal mass, but do it in a much uh, much faster method that would allow us to build more energy efficiently, more affordably. Um, it will also be a training center for that building methodology as well. Community supported energy, as we talked about, the cellulose gasification. We also have been working with a couple of the local farmers and talked to them about using some of their land. We actually have one who's interested in, in putting about 400 acres of oilseed production out there, which would be things like Jatropha and Castor, that can be compressed and the oils used in diesel engines. Now the byproduct of, of oil pressing is, is a seed cake that also can be converted through gasification into energy. Then of course the aquaponics is a closed loop system, again you see a small version of it back here. Very, very low input. You don't have to put in a whole lot of food, actually some of the fish food is grown in the system itself but the yield is great. The, um, as the fish do their natural thing, they, uh, they fertilize the plants, the plants clean the water, reoxygenate it, and then it is returned back into the, uh, the aquaculture part of the, of the project. Now normally, uh, aquaculture is a very water intensive operation. By doing it this way, it's very much more sustainable, and uh, it, it's something that, again, can feed a lot of people without a whole lot of space. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Nick for a minute. He's going to tell you about what we have going on with our Haiti project.
Is Robert Segundo in the house? Yeah, Robert. Uh, big hand for Robert. He's really been working with us for uh, several weeks on all of the three new renderings that we have. Uh, as Brian said, one of the things that we learned in trying to educate and communicate about these projects is that a picture is really do speak a thousand words and the 3D renderings even go further. So thanks again, Robert. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about the Haiti Initiative. Uh, as you all saw, the Roosevelt and the Earthship Project. Um, currently we're seeking investment for the Earthship Project. Those are really going to be our hubs of collaboration, our philosophy in action. So basically, when the events uh, struck in Haiti, we um, got on the phone and started crafting documents and started making phone calls, and for several several months, I guess uh, 12 months now, have been making headway on laying the groundwork to do some, not only relief efforts in Haiti, but um, you know we're really of the mind that um, What's happened in Haiti is really devastating. I mean, as a human race, we have really let this society down. So we're working to create a project that, um, you know, rebuild an economy is how you rebuild a nation. Instead of parachuting in and directing the show, you know, we want to work to do vocational training and education through some of our building systems um, where we can not only help to create safe housing for the Haitian community, but we can actually rebuild their economy. So I'm going to cruise through this presentation pretty quickly, and um, the presentation after this is also going to talk more about our building system, which we'll, t we'll touch on briefly here. So as I mentioned, we've been making several phone calls and, and had some really good connections on the ground in Haiti. Um, the Permaculture Guild, they've been doing some great work in Haiti for several years now, right? Just one year. Feel, they, they do such great work that it feels like several years. Um, but they were actually on the ground before uh, the earthquake actually struck. So um, we've been talking with uh, officials at the national level. Uh, we've talked to the Minister of Environment for Southeast Haiti. Um, we've been talking to the, the mayor of Jacmel. Jacmel is actually the cultural center of Haiti. It's also, prior to the quake last year, it was the, um, the tourist destination in Haiti. Uh, beautiful beaches, beautiful community, um, and again, very vivacious in the arts. Another organization that we've been working with, um, their webpage is Art for Haitian Children. It's uh, Art Creation Foundation for Children. Uh, for nearly 10 years or over 10 years now, they have been working to support uh, orphan children in Haiti. Um, and they do, a lot of their work is centered around art, and they really give these, uh, these children a, a new pathway to direct their energy in life. Um, they, the last email update I saw, they're working to find housing for over 90 orphans. They're connected to many families that are um, in need of buildings to live in. So, phase one, this is a five-phase project that we're looking to initiate. Phase one is simply going in and building a, a model home. Um, I'm going to get into the building method here in the next few slides. Uh, the second phase will actually build a second model home and begin to increase some of the technology attributes that we're working with here in the Tampa Bay area on some of our prototype units. Uh, and again, ultimately, like I said, we're working to rebuild the economy of Haiti. So the way we're going to do that is set up a manufacturing facility that is actually going to be producing some of the materials that we need to build the houses. Um, and then once we get through the first few prototype houses, then we'll actually build a closed loop off-grid neighborhood. Uh, Brian's going to talk on the next presentation about the one that we're working on here. And then that will be workforce housing, so that will be built in proximity to where the manufacturing plant will be. There's a lot of challenges in Haiti. Um, one of them is, you know, the business as usual. Um, some of the statistics that we found in the last uh, couple weeks as we're researching for this presentation are overwhelming, and I actually left some of them out because they're literally disturbing. Um, the things that have been happening down there since the quake. Um, 
one of the big things is, you know, the, the, the fiscal disadvantage. There's been an outpouring of support from finances, and they're, they're just simply not reaching the people. Um, and that's a big problem. So what that really comes down to is doing our homework and, um, you know, getting on the inside track. Through the political connections and conversations that we've had, we're fairly confident that we can create a shipping container full of materials and gear, ship that down there, work to get that through customs, um, hopefully without having to pay uh, too many people off because that's simply how it works down there. Um, and one of the other big things is finding land that is free and clear, that, that the families actually have a title. So we're making good headway. Um, we, uh, we've got a, a budget that we think with travel accommodations and to build a home for one family, uh, the first phase will be a $30,000 budget. Um, you know, some of the other challenges, uh, there is um, a lot of cutting of the corners in Haiti. The, the concrete, the mortar is typically diluted with sand, so it's not as strong. Steel is very expensive and it's just hard to find. So again, corners are cut and uh, rebar is not used as much as it should be. So what we're going to do is put together a shipping container. That shipping container will actually become part of the building that we will build down there. Um, one more important piece um, on the challenges is the, the, the people of Haiti, they have an expectation of the way their house should be. Rightfully so, it's part of their culture. Um, they're very uh, accustomed to block homes. They're very accustomed to homes that have a concrete exterior. So what we're going to do is build an earth bag home that also has SIPs panels, that also has a shipping container. And uh, what we will eventually do is stucco the outside of, um, of the home. So this is a couple pictures of what is known as an earth bag home. This is uh, a very efficient home. It has a great thermal mass to maintain a steady temperature. Um, it uh, is rated for uh, hurricanes, rated for earthquakes, some of the disasters that typically hit the island nation. And what this is, is basically a, a polypropylene. Um, and there's two ways you can do it. You can actually do it with a bag or you can do it with a, a big long roll. Um, some of you that have volunteered down at the airship, uh, we've got some walls down at the airship that are polypropylene, also known as an earth bag. So, um, after the earth bags begin to be bricked up, it will be reinforced with rebar, and then um, a, uh, a chicken wire, a mesh, will be applied to the outside of it, which will hold the concrete, the stucco that we put on. Again, uh, SIPS panels, structurally insulated panels, um, they're, they're very modular, uh, they're very efficient. And then, um, of course, shipping containers. So the shipping container that we send down will house the mechanical um, portion of the house, so the kitchen and the bathroom. Um, so again, Brian is going to touch on a lot of these points in the next presentation. A lot of the technologies that we're using are proven decade old proven. Some of them are, you know, thousands of year old techniques. And through all of our projects, what we're trying to do is really come back to the basics of what works. And typically, that also means that it, it works financially as well. Um, I think the next slide is the budget we have. Uh, we're, looking, we're looking to do a 14 day build out. Uh, we'll go down on the first trip and actually do a community charrette with the uh, community and the family that's going to live in the, in the structure. We'll lay the foundation, the concrete slab, and give the uh, concrete slab enough time to cure. Then we'll come down on the second trip and uh, we've got a 14 day build out. And again, the whole thing is vocational training and building a society that can use the techniques that we're talking about. Um, a quick snapshot of the budget that we think can get us there. And then another key part of all of our work is documentation so that we can educate about these systems that simply work. So um, right now, uh, you know, funding is a big part. The materials are a big part. 
and gaining a, a couple more key technology partners that can get us there. Um, I believe we have the connections on the ground and it really is just a matter of, of getting that $30,000 budget and setting up the trip. At that, Eric, can you hit uh, escape? Um, at that, we're going to move into the fourth presentation about the prototype units that we're building here in the Tampa Bay area. Um, this is the fourth acronym in the rehab, um, and Brian is going to come up and talk about affordable zero energy housings through the uh, company that we've built called Echo Build Systems. One of the things I wanted to mention about uh, what Nick said is, is one of the vocational training. Again, education is one of the key things that we're trying to accomplish through what we're, everything that we're doing. Uh, if we can't go and teach people how to do this themselves, then we've done nothing. We have a lot of people over there who have nothing to do and they have no homes. And what we need to do is teach them simple ways to construct very safe and very efficient homes. The earth bag construction is something that we've done there. Uh, at the Earthship, we've learned about it, we've taught other people about it, and that's our intention is to go to Haiti and do the same thing. Um, with, with the uh, project we have upcoming here in Tampa, we'll be using the EcoBuild system method. And as I mentioned to you before, while we were working uh, on the Earthship, one of the things that we determined was that pounding tires full of dirt is very, very labor intensive. So what we had to do was, was design something that we, was easily duplicatable, something that we could do quickly enough to where, uh, here in the United States, labor is, is one of the, the largest expenses in building any kind of building. And so we had to come up with a methodology that allowed us to build these buildings quickly and energy efficiently and do so in a manner where we feel we can create a home that is uh, comparable in price to stick framing or block construction but uh, we can have a significantly reduced energy bill by, by a number of different methods combined together to create a building system. Uh, the EcoBuild systems, what is it? Uh, it is an integrated systems planning. We start at the ground up, we look at our situation, and very much in keeping with permaculture design, look at where your surroundings, determine what you have available to you to use, the, uh, the temperature, the climate that you're in, the, the way that the sun, where the sun is in, in the sky at what time of year, the prevailing winds. Look at everything from the very beginning and build a home that's suited to the environment. One of the things that we've gotten very familiar with doing here in the United States is taking over a piece of farmland, going in with a bulldozer, laying it completely flat, creating a bunch of lines in there, and then laying houses out in a row and sticking a heating and air conditioning unit in there big enough to keep it comfortable. Now, when we had cheap energy, when we had easy energy, that was one thing. We're moving into an era where that's no longer the case, and we're going to have to become a little bit more innovative in our system thinking and start creating homes that use much, much less resources than what we are, what we're living in now. Um, and I think that's one of the, the best ways to start making a difference. So high efficiency and low or zero energy, and that is done, again, through careful design and careful system design and integration of design. Recycle building materials. Um, one of the basis for this particular building methodology that we'll be using now is the shipping container. Um, they're all over the world. They're in ports everywhere. Here in the United States, because of our trade deficit with China, uh, we have them stacking up left and right of the port. As a matter of fact, if you guys go right down the road from here to the Port of Tampa, you can see them stacked up as high as the eye can see. Um, they are very, very strong metal boxes. They're designed to be uh, picked up with a crane, loaded on ships and across the ocean in hurricane force winds, and then picked up with a uh, forklift on the other end full of goods and stuck on the back of the truck and uh, headed off to Iowa or Ohio or wherever they go to. And um, because of a, that trade deficit again, there are many more of them that come into the United States than what leave the United States. So it's a, uh, it's a very strong building block basis for this particular method. Natural building materials, site sourced earth, things that we find around us, bamboo, things like that. Any, anything, that uh, anything that doesn't require an energy intensive manufacturing process is, is fodder for our building methodology. Um, technological innovations. Um, in our information age here, the exchange of information has become very, very rapid. 
And as a result of that, as a result of collective intelligence, we have developed a lot of new systems that utilize a whole lot less energy and allow us to uh, combine those with these other natural building methods and create very, very energy efficient homes. Proven design techniques. Now, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about isn't new. The earth tubes that we use for to aid in the cooling, um, the passive design using solar thermal, creating thermal chimneys that use the sun to heat them up and create an updraft. These are techniques that were perfected thousands of years ago. What we do is we try to look back at uh, what people did before they had electricity to, to run that huge air conditioner. People had to live in homes and they, they wanted to be as comfortable as possible. So there are lots of methods out there that, that are very proven design techniques, time tested. Um, the reciprocal licensing business model. What we want to do again is teach people how to do this all over the world so that we can... One of the biggest things that I, I have as a, as a challenge as a contractor is I see these homes going in, $2 million homes that are zero energy. The, the people who buy $2 million homes are not the people who need zero energy homes. They're not the people who are making a decision between paying their electric bill and buying new shoes for their kids. Uh, so in order to make the largest impact the fastest, the way that I see it as a contractor is that we, we create a building methodology that's easily duplicable and that we can, we can spread this methodology across the country and across the world. Um, this is the first rendering of our first prototype here. Basically this is using two shipping containers and a modular system that sits on top of it. Um, from the time that the foundation is cured on this to the time that it's dried in, we can probably have a shell of a building up in about a week. Um, and then we go from that, uh, as you can see, it's just like any other home inside. And uh, the containers, once the, once the home is built, it doesn't look like shipping containers anymore. Now it can. If you want a modern looking home, you can create uh, uh, something very modern looking with the uh, exterior of the container. But the, uh, the methodology that we use is, um, is applying something to the outside of it that actually works with the building. Now this is the, uh, the prototype of one of our partners up in Mississippi, Bill Lilly, who built a uh, shipping container home up there. As you can see, this is, uh, this is the house going up right here. And um, it uh, actually won a number of green awards in Mississippi, and, and uh, Bill actually just released a movie that we're gonna be showing here pretty soon. Uh, he had a movie done during the process of the building of his home, it's pretty interesting. Um, this is the prototype of a home that I worked on for quite a while. Again, this is the 1.2 version of it. It has a number of systems integrated into it that, that help to make the home very energy efficient. As you see, we have a green, green roof uh, incorporated in this. Plants, not only do they shade a roof, uh, not only do they use a lot of the water that typically falls on a roof and would it otherwise end up as storm water, they also do what's called transpiration, and um, they actually can cool the temperature around the leaves by as much as 10 or 12 degrees on a hot day. So it actually helps to, uh, to cool the building as well as being aesthetically pleasing and also a potential source of uh, local food. Um, this is part of the integrated system that goes into this. Now what you can see here is we have underneath the floor there's a res reservoir of uh, rainwater that's stored there. We use a solar fire chiller system to modify the temperature of that water. We'll actually have two reservoirs, one hot and one cold. That water will be piped through a wall system and then we'll use a uh, desiccant wheel, which is uh, a way to remove humidity without electricity. We use a desiccant wheel to pull moisture out of the air that's, that's being drawn in from the outside. Again, these are just some more renderings of the reservoir. You see there's a, there's a cold water and a warm water reservoir there. Anytime you create cold, you also create heat. When you're air conditioning your house, if you go outside, you'll notice that it's blowing hot air out of that condensing unit there. That's actually removing heat from your building. So anytime you have heat that's blowing up in the air, you actually have a waste of energy right there. That heat can also be used to heat your hot water. It can be used for any kind of hot process. Um, this is the actual, as you can see, this is at the airship. This is uh, the actual testing of our wall method here. The PEX tubing that goes through there. Um, one of the things as we talk about using materials, metal is a great conductor of energy. It, uh, it radiates and it conducts very, very well. It's not something that you want as a uh, house by itself. If you've ever been inside of a shipping container or inside of a metal building, when the sun's shining on it, um, that is, that's what's known as a solar oven. 
So what we do is um, we're, you can see there's rebar up here. We have the PEX tubing laced through there. That PEX tubing will carry either warm or cool water through there. Um, then we are working on applying some, uh, some mud here. This is actually the day, this is our test day here. We were working on our first test batch here, getting the mix right of it. This is site sourced earth that's been screened for uh, larger aggregates and organic material. It's mixed with a cement. And then uh, there's Nicholas, who's right back in the back here. We're spraying it on. Now that's a shot creep machine, which is applying that material at about 300 miles an hour. So instead of pounding it inside of a sledge, uh, inside of a tire with a sledgehammer or a backfill tamper, we use uh, we use the projection of the shot creep machine to create that dense thermal mass. Now, here we had a little bit too much water in it first. Again, this is part of the technology park as as uh, learning how to control the mixture and how to how to make this work. But what we end up with is a wall system that has dense thermal mass of very tightly compressed earth and cement. The tubing is runs through the middle of that that we can run warm or cool water through there. Now that that. That uh, thermal mass holds energy, much like a battery stores energy. So it allows us to, uh, that is our conditioning method. Instead of air conditioning, we're actually conditioning the building materials themselves. The outside layer you see there is, again, the papercrete that we talked about earlier. It looks like stucco on the outside, but it has the insulation value of pink fiberglass. So that, is, that, uh, that goes on the outside of the thermal mass that keeps the outside temperature from influencing the inside thermal mass temperature, that thermal mass is applied directly to the metal, which again radiates inside of the building and helps to remove heat from the building. Then we use the passive solar methods to just gently move air through there and we create a comfortable space that uses much, much less energy than air conditioning. So, one of our first projects here, one of the things that I realized was that in doing all of this, one of the things that is very wasteful about our, our, our practices right now is the fact that we each one of us has our own little system in their home. We all have an air conditioning unit, we all have our water system, we all have everything that, uh, that basically provides, provides us with the comforts. Now, a lot of these things like a solar chiller system, it's very expensive to do it by itself. A ground loop system, a geothermal unit, a lot of you guys are familiar with geothermal heating and cooling. Those are very expensive things to do on their own, but if you apply that to a neighborhood design, if you put 10 or 12 houses together on a geothermal system, you don't have to drill, drill two or three wells for each home. You can create one large ground loop for the entire community, and that, that cost can be distributed among the houses. The chiller system that we'll be using for the community here in Tampa, it's gonna be a co-housing community. The chiller system that we use in order to buy one for one house is about $22,000. And that's pretty pricey for a piece of heating and cooling equipment for your home. However, the one that's large enough to do about 13 to 17 homes is $45,000. So you can see for just over half the price of what it costs to do one house, we can do somewhere between almost 20 homes. So the economies of scale come into play when we talk about all of this stuff, including our gray water treatment. It makes a lot more sense to pull gray water uh, pull gray water out of a home and use it to grow food producing plants when you have a really large system that can produce copious amounts of food can produce can uh, can treat copious amounts of water now that water comes through a system and it can be reused for irrigation toilet flushing all kinds of processes um, so this is a typical co-housing community here now these homes will uh, each each home will have its own private space everyone will have their own home it'll have You'll have your kitchen and everything else. The homes are typically smaller in a co-housing community because of the fact that they share a lot of amenities. The gardens, the green spaces are all very, very large and luxurious because the, the funds have gone into creating these wonderful, safe community spaces. Um, part of, part of uh, the concept of co-housing also is shared responsibility. Typically, co-housing communities have a large community center with a commercial kitchen in them and uh, people take turns uh, providing the cooking for the entire community, sometimes three to five times a week. Some communities do that every night they have a shared meal. What that allows people to do is uh, right now with our economic state, most typical nuclear families, the uh, wife, husband, and two kids, both parents have to work in order to support that, that operation. And so um, you have to work, you work all day long, you come home, you gotta prepare a meal for the kids and then get the kids to bed and then you get up and do the whole thing over again day. With a co-housing community of 15 or 20 homes, that 
that some of that work gets delegated and, and shared, that responsibility gets shared among the community. Aging in place, it's a lot safer to, um, for older people to have people around that they know as they age in place, that people that they can trust, people that they see every single day. <laughs> When you make a trip to the store, what what? It's not a big deal to uh, stop by and pick up uh, pick up something for your neighbor on the way out. And part of that sharing of responsibility means that you get to share smiles and good times with people. Um, so, it, part of that sense of community, that knowing your neighbors, that interaction with one another, creates a living environment that's much less stressful and uh, and has has been found time and time again to instill a greater sense of well-being in people. So not only is this good for your physical health and the fact that you're going to be eating much more healthy foods, and it's also good for your mental well-being as well. Um, this is, again, the property up in Carrollwood here where we have a uh, piece of property. Oh, this is Lake Ellen, and uh, this is where our first uh, community is going to be going in. It's the Peacock Estates up in Lake Ellen. Um, one, of our, one of the architects on the team here, Carol, is in the audience tonight. She's come up with a preliminary, this is just kind of an idea of kind of how it can be laid out. As you see, the homes are centered around a large green space. This is actually projected over a Google Earth image of the property. Uh, shared community space here, so everyone has equal access to the lake. This isn't the exclusive community where, the, where a few homes are lined up against the water and then everybody else is separated away from that. Communal gardens in the middle. The pathways that run from the parking areas into the homes, as you can see, this is very pedestrian centric. The cars are relegated to the outside, so uh, safe place for kids to play, safe place for people to walk around. And uh, along the pathways is that great water garden system, so we'll actually be creating walkways that are not only aesthetically beautiful, but they also are functional. They clean the water up and they actually produce food. These are some uh, shots of the property here, and uh, some of you people are here tonight because you've joined the Tampa Bay Co-Housing Group. What we'll be doing here in the coming months is actually bringing a lot of people together to meet, to decide how to design the community. Part of what we do here at the Roosevelt and the Earthship is that we invite people to come in and tell us what they want. We don't want to be a developer who goes in and mows down a piece of property and throws up a bunch of houses. We want to know what people want to live in. We want people to help create the community themselves. You know what you want. You know where you want to live. You know the people that you want to live around. You want to know how those, how your life is going to function. So we want to ask, we want you to participate in this and tell us what you want to see. Some more shots of the property, as you can see, it's a very gorgeous piece of property and it's a great place to, to, to start our first project. There's Lake Ellen right there. Um, so if you guys are interested in co-housing, learning more about it, learning how to create a community, uh, we have a meetup group that we just started. It's meetup.com, Tampa Bay Co-Housing Group. That's my name right there. That's my phone number and my email address. If you have any questions or want to know any more about that, then definitely do not hesitate to get in touch with us. And with that, I'm going to bring Rudy Arnauts up here, and he is going to tell you guys about the beginning of financial permaculture. And that is what ties all of this together. That's what makes community work, keeping, keeping everything within the community and strengthening community. Rudy? This is the last one. Uh, maybe everybody should get up, stretch out. Everybody okay? Get up a minute. Probably not a bad suggestion. All right, here we go. Uh, <coughs> well, we're going to be talking about. Oh, all right. Take a minute. What well, we're going to be talking about here in the last presentation is sort of the economics that uh, pulls all these things together. Um, in order for any any business to work, even a, especially in my opinion, a social enterprise, it has to make economic sense. Um, it's no secret that uh, we live in some dire economic times. However, there are certain trends in the current economic system that we live in that are actually moving forward very quickly. So what I would like to do during this portion of the presentation is touch upon those very briefly and then sort of summarize how all these projects that we have initiated are being tied together and taking the best elements of the proven business trends that are working today 
and wrapping them into one engine that we call the Campus TV platform. If you look at the issues that we face, we have a climate crisis. Some people may think it's more of a crisis than others. Some people don't think it's a crisis at all, but the majority of us are in agreement that we have a climate crisis. We have an energy crisis. Um, we're predicting $5 gas probably by the end of next year. We have a housing crisis. We have a housing bubble that burst. We have uh, people that can't afford to live in the homes that they live in. Food and credit crisis. Employment, cost of living index, the cost of uh, living is going up faster than, than uh, people are uh, having their wages increase. All of these in some shape or form can be traced back to we live in a very centralized economic system. We live in a, in a system, for example, with, um, with energy where we tap into a central power grid. And the, with food, we have a couple of very, very large companies that produce the vast majority of the food that we consume. And what we have been talking about with permaculture is basically the decentralization of, of resources. Uh, permaculture design, which we've discussed in the, in the previous four topics, is a method of design that is harmonious with the environment. We're talking about a closed loop system and a localized concentration of resources. So in uh, the co-housing development, for instance, we're talking about a completely off-grid uh, project that will be generating its own power supply, its own water supply, and be growing a, a significant portion of the food that the residents will consume. Essentially, what we're talking about in financial permaculture is the financial extension of that. And we have a system right now that is based predominantly on, on paper currency. And a lot of the economic policy is dictated by the fact that we think we can just print more of that paper to solve a problem. And if you just look at that from a common sense perspective, that is not something that will sustain itself long term. If you look at uh, uh, throughout history economics uh, in areas around the world, we have a very, very good potential of being right on the brink of hyperinflation, where things spiral down and get more increasingly more expensive and so on. So what we're talking about is a system that has an alternative medium of exchange. Um, localized currency. There are localized currencies popping up all over the world. It's a proven system. And it would be something like, for example, the Tampa Bay dollar, what have you. And the purpose behind having a local currency is to keep trade and economic investment in the local community. So there is, there is a, a network that joins the local currency network and basically agrees the same way that we agree to trade goods and services now for a piece of paper that says Federal Reserve Note Private Corporation, by the way. Um, we agree to exchange goods and services that are local. And there are many, many uh, communities that are adapting this system right now. Barter. Barter is one of the oldest forms of uh, economic exchange. Um, there are actually some... Misha, are you ready? The Trade Exchange Online is one of the fastest growing companies on the internet that uh, basically connects uh, groups like ours. And this actually uh, is how we have been able to monetize, not monetize, been able to um, actualize the build out of, of this, this, this building right here. Over a two year period, we've been able to, on a retail value, put about a quarter of a million dollars worth of improvement in this building. And we did that with a fraction of that in cash, less than 10% of that in cash. And uh, time banking is another uh, form of that kind of exchange, and that basically assigns a certain value to a certain skill. An hour's worth of an electrician's labor can be traded for an hour's worth of a masonry worker or what have you. So what, what we're looking to do with uh, all these projects is capitalizing upon one of the uh, fastest growing trends in business right now, which is Web 2.0 technology. Does everyone know what I mean by Web 2.0? Real quick, when the internet first came out, um, that time period is best known as Web 1.0, the first generation of the internet. Information basically is one directional. You go to the internet, you retrieve information. The uh, era that we live in right now is commonly referred to as Web 2.0, where the internet itself is being used as a medium for collaboration. Uh, very few people actually know this, but Wikipedia, the number eight website in the world, was started right here in St. Petersburg. 
And we're talking about a website that in a little over three years was, became one of the top 10 websites in the world from entirely user-generated content. <laughs> and then uh, the last but not least, a sense of community where basically uh, taking the decentralization of an economic system to where we actually connect different groups of people and set up a peer-to-peer -peer lending system. Successful trends in business. Um, Web 2.0. Uh, the McKinsey Report is one of the most respected economic uh, uh, review commissions out there. Basically analyzed now for four years in a row uh, over 3,200 businesses to see how much uh, they are using Web 2.0 in running their company. Over two-thirds of these businesses are now uh, investing heavily into that arena and basically what all of them are finding is that they are increasing their marketing reach, increasing their customer participation at a lower cost. Uh, cloud computing, uh, where basically all the uh, information that the companies are sharing is in the cloud, on an online platform. Global crowdsourcing. Coase's law is uh, an economic principle that says you will continue to produce additional items until the cost of that item equals the cost of producing it in-house. So with a, a, an internet connected system, the cost of global crowdsourcing is practically nil. A company can basically use um, an engineering force of a thousand engineers for about the same amount of money as it can put it out to the world for participation and use several hundred thousand engineers. Boeing is one of the companies that actually does that very well. Uh, cumulative buying power. One block off the grid is a uh, company that basically um, takes all the uh, purchasing power uh, for solar installations on a residential scale and simplifies that entire process because each state has its own sets of regulation and so on. And it basically uh, accumulates enough people to get to a certain threshold where it makes the most financial sense for that region. Has anybody ever heard of Groupon? Groupon is one of the... Uh, Groupon. Basically what Groupon is, it's a company that was started in November 2008. Um, in 2010 they uh, took in over $500 million. And pretty much what their entire business model is, is they will go into a local community and negotiate a bulk purchase deal with a certain vendor for 50% off for product X and a certain threshold has to be met in order for that deal to go live. So you have to get to 100 of these, these units to be sold in order for that deal to go live and then everyone gets shares in the savings. This is the first company that is projected to do a billion dollars in sales faster than any other company ever in history. Uh, we will touch briefly upon a, a few examples of crowdfunding where again the same principle that is being used by Groupon is actually being used by several companies out there right now to raise capital. And this is one of the avenues, obviously, that we intend to go forward to uh, capitalize all of these efforts that we've been talking to you guys about today. <laughs> community building. Um, the trend in community building where, where it's, it's um, the co-creation of the product by the customer. You see that in uh, the co-housing development that Brian mentioned, where essentially you, you get the ultimate purchasers in the project involved from the very beginning on the onset and they have a hand in the co-design of the product that they eventually end up buying. And then last but not least, uh, education and transparency of information. Wikinomics, basically this uh, concept of what we're doing over here at the Roosevelt was uh, initiated by two books, Wikinomics being the first one. Uh, a guy named Don Tapscott is the first one to uh, comprehensively describe everything that we're talking about. Wikinomics is a business philosophy that's based on openness, peering, sharing, and acting globally. Uh, we discussed Coase's Law, where essentially, through the interconnectivity of the internet, a company now can use a global pool of resources to conduct its own business. One of the best known examples is the Gold Cup uh, Challenge. Gold Cup is a gold mining company that had its stocks completely down in the dumps. They own about 80,000 acres of land. And traditionally in the gold mining industry, which is a very conservative industry, the most guarded secret that you have are your geological test results of your property. 
I don't really know why, because if you own the property, who cares what the geological test results are, but it's not an industry where you go out and, and share that type of information. So the CEO of the company decided to put a challenge out there called the Gold Cup Challenge and made all these test results public and announced to the world that there is a $575,000 prize available to anyone that can find gold on this property. They had 110 submissions from around the world. The most interesting thing about it right away was that over half of these submissions were using techniques that the company was not even aware existed in order to find gold. They had this one way of finding gold and over half of these 110 submissions were actually using entirely different techniques that they weren't even aware of. Over 80% of these 110 sites ended up yielding gold. They pulled about $3 billion worth of gold out of the property. So that's a pretty good investment for $575,000. The uh, winning entry actually ended up being a collaboration between two different companies that pooled their resources and their techniques together. And even though the actual money that they won, I think the top prize was about $100,000, wasn't really worth it per se in terms of the amount of effort that they put in, but it saved them about a two and a half year exposure curve and they immediately became one of the top firms getting hired here in the United States. Company out of Australia, by the way. Um, the other book is The Culting of Brands by uh, Douglas Atkin. The Culting of Brands is a book that basically describes what builds a cult-like following for a brand. Uh, any Mac users in the crowd? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? So uh, a cult-like following for a brand is, is essentially defined as if a consumer of a brand goes out and preaches to others, you should use this brand without getting paid for it, that's pretty much the definition of a cult-like following. You see that in Apple, Harley-Davidson, Saturn, JetBlue, and the key to having a cult-like following uh, for your brand is actually something very counterintuitive. You have to pretty much completely let go of it. And a community will build around your brand and you actually transition from what Atkin refers to as the brand leader to the community nurturer. The last thing you could ever ever do is censor what the community says. So the transparency, which is a theme that you'll see recurring throughout this, the, the, this presentation, the transparency to pull this off, is crucial and one of the things that we're very big on with everything that we do here is the complete financial transparency of all these operations we will show we are showing what what things truly cost and as we monetize this operation we will not only show that we'll show how much money we're making and most importantly we'll show who gets what share of that money and why as the community grows you find that increased interaction within the community gets stronger the more people join the network. So it's a cumulative effect. Huddle is a uh, collaborative platform, a software company, that Business Week has referred to as the next Google. Has anybody ever heard of Huddle? Okay. Essentially what Huddle does is it provides all the software tools that you would need to collaborate on projects in real time around the world no matter where you are. Um, this company um, was set up in 2006. It's been growing at 25 to 50 percent a month since. Um, they joint venture with a uh, company called Intercall, which is a uh, web conferencing service that has over 80 percent of the Fortune 500 as one of their partners. Then they partnered up with uh, HP, and now they're partnered up with LinkedIn, which gave them over a million subscribers overnight. Their business model is subscription-based. You basically pay them $8 a month for a minimum, I believe, of at least 20 users in your company. And then you can cl through cloud computing, so all this information you don't have to even store on a hard drive, through cloud computing, Huddle will provide the infrastructure that you need to collaborate for your business, not just